Good afternoon to all of you. It's very nice to see you all again after the summer's break and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on enforcing the Digital Markets Act. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. I'm delighted to introduce to our distinguished speaker uh, today, Thomas Kremler. A very warm welcome to you, Thomas, and thank you very much for being with us today and for taking time out of your busy schedule. And we look forward to your presentation. Thomas Kremler is head of the unit of e-commerce and the data economy in the European Commission's Directorate General for Competition. He was previously head of the Digital Service Market Task Force responsible for the e-commerce e sector inquiry. Thomas also served as deputy head of the unit for antitrust in the information industries, internet and consumers, electronic sectors. Before joining the European Commission, he worked as a, a agent representing the Austrian government before the European courts. Thomas' presentation will take around 20 to 25 minutes, and then I will go to you, the, the audience, for questions and answers. And you can use the Q&A function, as you know, at the bottom of your screen. As is usual, today's presentation and Q&A is on the record. And I'd appreciate very much if you could give your name and affiliation when you're asking questions. And thank you very much for doing that. Please join our discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. There is a lot of interest and in and discussion about the Digital Markets Act. Today's webinar is very timely as Thomas Kremler is talking to about us about enforcing the Digital Markets Act. Thomas will discuss its main features and what the European Commission hopes to achieve with the DMA. He will also elaborate on how the Commission is preparing for the enforcement of the DMA and its strategy to ensure that the DMA is effectively enforced and how it is, will prioritise the different areas. He will also discuss the challenges the Commission expects to face in relation to enforcement and how it plans to address such challenges. Finally, Thomas will discuss how third party stakeholders in the digital economy can contribute to successful enforcement of the DMA. Thomas is one of the two antitrust officials to head up the new EU directorate set up to enforce the Digital Markets Act. He is highly placed to give leadership in this area. We are privileged to have you here today, Thomas, at such a key time. So it's over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Joyce, for this intro. Now the expectations are very high. I will hope I can fulfill <laughs> all the high expectations that you set. Uh, indeed, what you say is very correct. Uh, this is a very timely moment to talk about uh, the Digital Markets Act. It has been signed, uh, co-signed by the co-legislators, the parliament and the council uh, last week. That means uh, that it will be published in the official journal in the next uh, couple of days and will then enter into force around uh, mid-October and then the deadlines uh, will start. So before looking into the concrete enforcement challenges and the concrete enforcement uh, issues that lie uh, before us, not only us as the regulator, but also those who will be the beneficiaries of the DMA and those who will be at the receiving end, if I may say so, of the DMA, the potential gatekeepers, I want to take a, a look back actually uh, to the genesis of the DMA. So I want to talk a bit about the why, how did we actually arrive where we are now? Why do we have the DMA in the first place? Then a bit about the how, how is the DMA going to work? Uh, what are its main features? And then at the end, a bit about the when, how is this uh, gonna unfold? Uh, so let me first start with uh, the, how, the why. So why did we get there? That uh, needs a bit of looking back into, let's say 20 years of enforcement into unilateral conduct uh, cases in, in the EU. I think there's many lessons that we can draw from that. We've started enforcement in platform markets back in the 2000s uh, with the Microsoft cases where we looked into tying and interoperability issues. We have then gone on uh, in the Google shopping uh, cases, uh, which have been confirmed by the court um, recently. Uh, into uh, issues of self, so-called self-preferencing, so where a platform actually 
favors its own products uh, on the platform to the detriment of rivals. We have in the Intel and Qualcomm cases uh, looked into exclusivity rebates, uh, a long running saga, which is uh, still ongoing after 20 years uh, and bouncing up and back in courts, uh, especially when it comes to the Intel case. Uh, and we've just recently uh, won, if I may say so, uh, the Android uh, decision in, in court, where the court looked into Google's behavior uh, in relation to mobile, its mobile ecosystem. Now, Concretely, we are turning, in terms of concrete enforcement issues, we are turning uh, to look into data-related uh, cases more and more. We have an Amazon case pending where we are just uh, on the antitrust side, where we are just consulting on potential commitments. So Amazon would basically silo, separate its data sets uh, between the marketplace and the retail. Um, the retail business, we have a Facebook case that is about data use, and we have a Google case about ad tech, which is also very uh, prominent in terms of data use. All of this uh, to basically set the scene, um, to draw the lessons or what lessons can actually be drawn from all of these cases and from all of the experience that we have in the EU with enforcement of antitrust rules in tech markets. I think uh, one of the lessons to be drawn that the case by case approach that we have followed in the last 20 years has definitely an advantage as it allows for uh, very, very uh, deep diving into uh, the specific markets, uh, getting to the bottom uh, of the market realities. That, that's very important in, 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 in the antitrust world and uh, it's, it's important that we get it right. But what it leads to, uh, there's a nice uh, long German word in my native tongue, uh, it's very good for what is called in German Einzelfallgerechtigkeit, which translates into individual justice in each and every case. So antitrust is very good at that, at achieving that. Uh, it's also uh, good if remedies need to be tailored to a very specific conduct or a very specific abuse. But there's also drawbacks at that. Now I'm coming to the DMA. The drawbacks are that these procedures take very long. That sometimes uh, when we finish an antitrust case, the market has actually moved on and the remedies uh, that uh, we have imposed might actually come too late in some of the markets. For instance, because a market has dipped and a, a dominant position can no longer be challenged uh, because of that. The remedies that we can impose in antitrust cases uh, as it is an abuse control system, as you know, in the, in the European Union needs to be focused on the concrete abuse. So we cannot go beyond the abuse that limits us in, in the kinds of remedies that uh, we can uh, basically impose on companies. So antitrust is really a difficult tool and it's not impossible, I, I would say, but it's difficult to address with the current antitrust uh, tools that we have uh, systemic issues. For instance, if a market uh, is going to tip, not because certain behavior of a company, but because of the market structure. Think about network effects. If a market is prone to direct or indirect network effects and people go to a platform because other people are there, uh, that's more market structure type of thing. That's not sometimes not related to conduct. That's very difficult uh, to tackle with an abuse control system. Uh, another example is leveraging. So if a company is very strong in one market and then leverages this market power in another market, that's, uh, as we know now from, from the Google Shopping judgment, uh, in and of itself, uh, not prohibited or not abusive, mm -hmm. but it can be tackled under, under antitrust. Uh, the problem that arises when this behavior covers not only one market, but five markets or, or more. Then in terms of an antitrust case, you'd have to basically investigate all these five markets in parallel that have to establish that there are foreclosure effects, uh, uh, this is time consuming. Uh, this is not really reflecting the market reality of ecosystems and envelopment strategies where companies, gatekeeping companies can leverage from, from one strong market into many different markets. It's very hard to deal with that uh, under the current, uh, with the current antitrust tools. Uh, also data access issues. They're really hard to uh, tackle uh, under, under the current antitrust tools because the threshold to give access to data is, is relatively high. Uh, in the EU. So all of this has led to a lot of policy, policy reflections in the world, basically, not just in, in the European Union. Many reports have been written in the UK, in the US, uh, in Japan, in, in Australia. 
And all of uh, those reports come to the conclusion that antitrust uh, as it stands needs to be complemented uh, by ex ante rules, which are uh, basically prescribing uh, or imposing obligations on uh, companies with substantial market power, strategic market status, bottleneck power, you name it. There's many names that have been uh, found for these companies. Uh, the DMA uses the name gatekeeper uh, to impose on these companies actually ex ante, so not ex post after the conduct has happened, but upfront uh, before conduct has happened, obligations that they have to comply with. Mm -hmm. So I think there's consensus around the world now that this complementary uh, powers are actually needed. Now you can have two models uh, of how to implement that. Um, and, and one model is the DMA model, which is uh, largely, I would say, a legislator driven model, where the legislator has taken the big decisions. The big trade-offs have been made by the legislator. Uh, but the legislator has basically struck the balance between flexibility, efficiency, uh, and legal certainty, uh, and has made this an innovation. I shouldn't forget. And where the legislator has made these trade-offs already in formulating the specific obligations that are going to be imposed uh, on gatekeeping companies. And another model is is a more regulator-driven model, where the legislator just works with broad brush clauses and basically entrusts the regulator. Uh, to come up uh, with the right solutions. Both of these models have advantages and disadvantages. The EU has deliberately chosen the first model for two reasons, uh, for constitutional reasons, because in the EU, obviously, we work with the, with the principle of conferral of powers. So the EU only has the competences conferred to it by the treaties. Mm -hmm. and, and the treaties, uh, in, in, in this case, the legal base that we used is an internal market uh, legal base, which means uh, that uh, we have to rely on uh, the internal market rules uh, for the D for DMA purposes. Uh, and a an even more important reason is that uh, we have opted for the system because of the, of the drawbacks of the antitrust enforcement system, the case by case system, where we have to analyze conduct, uh, specific conduct on the basis of a case by case analysis, which turned out to be difficult uh, in these markets. So, we have opted in the EU for a legislator driven model. What does this now mean in, in practice? That means, first of all, uh, which is quite important, that there's no efficiency defense in the DMA. So you cannot uh, justify your conduct as a gatekeeping company uh, by saying, wait, wait a moment. Uh, what I'm doing here is actually very efficient, pro competitive, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't lead to the harm uh, that uh, you think it would lead to. And therefore, this conduct in the specific circumstances of my case. Uh, is uh, positive, net positive uh, for consumers. That is not uh, a defense that is possible under the DMA because the assumption is that the legislator has basically already, when designing the rules, made these trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So if the legislator has come to the conclusion, for instance, that it is on balance better that um, an, an app store provider opens up uh, its, uh, its system and provides a second app store, the assumption is that the legislator has basically weighed the innovation if incentives for this app store provider against the innovation incentives for, for the app developers and has basically made this, uh, this trade-off already in the law. Therefore, an efficiency defense is not necessary. So the DMA, as I said, is an ex-ante regulatory tool. It's not a competition law, but it has goals uh, which are partly similar to competition law, but not uh, totally overlapping. So the two goals of the DMA are contestability, ensuring contestability of markets where gatekeepers are present, and fairness. You find uh, a description of what is meant by contestability in uh, recital 32 of the DMA. It's basically about the ability uh, of uh, companies that are reliant on gatekeepers uh, to overcome barriers to entry and expansion so that they can also enter into the market with the gatekeepers present in, in, in very short words. So obviously the recital is a bit longer and more sophisticated, but that's the summary. And uh, fairness uh, is, a, is a concept that is described as the imbalance uh, between rights and obligations uh, between the gatekeeping companies and uh, their business users. So the contestability con concept is obviously not alien uh, to competition law, it comes from from um, lowering barriers to entry, but it goes wider. It allows for us to have non-conduct based remedies, which the DMA basically provides for. For instance, as I said before, access remedies, 
irrespective of any conduct that the company has has been uh, carrying out, uh, the DMA provides for, for instance, for data portability. So users mm -hmm. should be able to take out the data from the gatekeeping platform and move them to a competing platform. That should ensure contestability uh, of uh, of this market markets, I should say. When it comes to fairness, uh, fairness is actually a very old concept. You find it in competition law, but you find it in many laws that are actually older than competition law in the European Union, in many unfair trading laws um, that date back uh, to the 1900s. So fairness is not something alien to our legal systems. And fairness between uh, business users and, and, and bigger companies with more market power is not something uh, totally alien to uh, what uh, we know from different laws. So there is obviously a, a relationship between what competition law and antitrust law wants to achieve in terms of contestability and also in terms of fairness, but the DMA goes beyond. The DMA tackles actually issues that are related to market structure that are independent of uh, conduct of a specific uh, company. So quickly, and I guess uh, many of you are very familiar with the DMA, so I'm not going to dwell on that very much. This is about uh, the how the legislator has implemented that. Uh, the legislator has basically defined uh, a number of so-called core platform services that include search engines, uh, uh, online intermediation services, messaging services. And if a company fulfills uh, certain thresholds, uh, which you find in the DMA, then this company will be designated for a specific service on the basis of uh, quantitative criteria as a gatekeeper that will have to comply with all the obligations uh, that DMA uh, provides for. Uh, a company can rebut this presumption that the figures would actually uh, lead it to have a gatekeeper status, but only in, in very, very limited circumstances. That's on purpose. The legislator has said, if a company fulfills certain uh, business user and end user thresholds, it's 45 million, and 10,000 business, 45 million end users, 10,000 business users, then a company is deemed to be a gatekeeper for this specific service. Uh, if a company is not deemed to be a gatekeeper or doesn't fall within the thresholds, the commission still has the possibility to qualitatively assess the position of this company and come to the conclusion uh, that a company is a gatekeeper. As I said, I'm not going to bore you with, with all of these details on the DMA. I'm sure you, you're all familiar with, uh, with it. You want to learn I guess more how it's going to be implemented in practice, the black letter law is less interesting, I would think. So the obligations, therefore, I'm not going to go into them very much. They're all set out in the articles five, uh, six, and seven. I think what is going to be really interesting is how they're going to be interpreted and what are the challenges. So now let me talk uh, about that. So first of all, I mean, let's acknowledge it. Uh, the DMA is uncharted territory for both us as a regulator, uh, and for the potential gatekeepers, but also for third parties who have an interest in, in uh, the enforcement of the DMA. So it's all, um, I don't want to say trial and error because that sounds as if we <clears throat> what we're doing. We obviously have uh, quite, we have our objectives in mind and the contestability and fairness objectives are very firmly set in the law, but it's uh, testing. Uh, and, and, and this implies a lot of, uh, discussions with the gatekeepers who have to explain their business models to us who have to and also third parties who have to explain the market realities uh, to us so that we can apply the law in a way that makes sense uh, in the market one of the big uh, challenges i think for a regulator in in this kind of an enforcement system is the big information asymmetry between what we know as regulators about the market and what the gatekeepers know about their products about the functioning of the market that's very difficult at least in the first stage uh, when you're on a, on a very steep learning curve to bridge. So how can you bridge that? I think there's uh, a number of ways to bridge that. First of all, we want to start with a collaborative enforcement approach as a starting point. So we are inviting the gatekeeping companies to explain to us uh, how their business models look like, uh, what we would uh, want to see in terms of uh, compliance, and we'll be open to a dialogue uh, to find solutions which are compliant with the law at the same time, but also make sense from a business uh, reality perspective uh, for the gatekeeping companies. But if that doesn't work, um, then you'd also have to uh, bring in uh, the guns, if I can say so. Um, that means uh, there is plenty of very tough enforcement uh, 
possibilities that the DMB provides for. We can go for periodic penalty payments, relatively high fines, and as a last resort, even structural remedies if a company doesn't want to comply uh, with the DMA. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think the starting point is that we want to try a collaborative method. We can also call it the carrot and stick uh, approach if you want. I mean, we will first try to uh, discuss with the gatekeepers and only in a second stage a resort to, to enforcement if necessary. So that's the first um, thing uh, to bridge uh, the information asymmetry. The, the second thing is bring in third parties. Uh, bring in third parties so that we basically have, uh, as I would call it, a reality check uh, on, on the markets. Uh, and there's uh, quite some uh, tools in the DMA where we can in, bring in third parties formally speaking, but there's also obviously the possibility to talk to third parties informally about potential complaints, potential compliance issues. We really want to have an open door policy where we bring in uh, third parties early early on to help us uh, in determining whether a gatekeeper is actually compliant uh, with the obligations. And then we need to ramp up our own knowledge. Uh, we will do this in-house and we will also do this with the help uh, of external uh, experts. So a lot of um, enforcement in the DMA is actually front-loaded. That means that a lot will happen in the in the first phase when uh, gatekeepers will have to be designated under the formal uh, uh, quantitative designation process, which is going to happen over the summer next year. And then gatekeepers after designation have six months to comply. And then uh, compliance efforts and compliance will really get uh, hot, if I may say so, uh, beginning of 2024. This is when gatekeepers will have to comply with all of the obligations in one go, which for many of the gatekeepers already means that they have to prepare now in order to be ready for, for the 2024 uh, date. How in practice uh, will uh, the DMA interact uh, with competition law? That's also a question that is often raised. So are we going to stop antitrust enforcement in digital markets? Uh, that's certainly not the plan at all. What obviously doesn't make a lot of sense is to replicate uh, DMA procedures uh, with uh, parallel antitrust proceedings. Uh, that's not something uh, that we are planning on, but the DMA is a very, or has a very limited set of obligations. It, uh, it has its limits. It, it doesn't go beyond the obligations which are in the act, although there's an updating mechanism, but uh, there are limits to what can be done under the DMA. So in essence, antitrust enforcement will fill the gaps between what is regulated under the DMA and what is not regulated under the DMA. So the DMA deals with, I may say, so the most egregious behavior of gatekeeping companies. And if new uh, behavior, new conduct comes up or conduct which isn't fully covered by the DMA, then antitrust enforcement uh, can kick in. I mean, as in the past, there's obviously the two instruments uh, will run in parallel. That's not new. That, that is something that's done in, uh, in telecommunications law. And the Court of Justice has recently confirmed in a case uh, that uh, concerns the postal sector, that there needs to be between sectorial regulation, which the DMA is basically, and general antitrust, um, there needs to be coordination between the two tools and the regulators that work on the two tools in order to avoid uh, issues of uh, double jeopardy. So in, end, in the end, there will have to be a very uh, clear coordination between those who enforce the DMA, which is the commission, but also the national competition authorities, which go on enforcing uh, their national competition laws, but also data protection uh, regulators. Uh, because as we know, the DMA refers a lot uh, to concepts of the GDPR, and uh, obviously these need to be interpreted uniformly. Just recently, yesterday, there was an opinion by Advocate General Rantos in, in the German Meta case, where, the, where he reiterated uh, that it is very important that the data protection uh, offices and, and authorities and the competition authorities uh, work together on the DMA, uh, on on the, yeah, on the DMA, not in this context, but uh, here it was a competition on GDPR, but uh, obviously this can be extrapolated uh, to, to the DMA. Looking at the time, I think I'm gonna conclude here and, and leave it to questions. What I wanted to say is obviously the DMA is not just a challenge for the regulator, it's also a challenge for, for the beneficiaries uh, of, of the obligations. Uh, so we invite very much uh, 
a collaborative uh, discussion with them as well. As I said, the, the doors are open. And also for the gatekeepers, uh, we are very much already engaging with many of the gatekeepers uh, as we speak. Uh, going forward, I think this uh, has to intensify. To make this work, uh, I think it needs a common effort. Uh, and it, it's in the interest, uh, I think, of everybody involved uh, to make it work. Because if it doesn't work, there's the risk that uh, there will be even more backlash. Uh, I think uh, that, um, I think, right, let's put it simple. This just, uh, we need to make this work collectively. And I think uh, the best way to do that is, is to try this in a col collaborative way. Uh, if that doesn't work, I mean, the commission is, is obviously ready to use all the tools available under, under the instrument uh, to make uh, gatekeeping companies comply with the law. Thank you very much.